So, what is uh, geotechnics? Well, uh, it was formerly called soil mechanics or soil physics, and um, I think those, those titles really better describe what's on the tin. Um, basically, it's a branch of civil engineering concerned with the engineering behaviour of earth materials. Well, why is that important? Uh, well, if it doesn't fly and it doesn't float, then it sits on the ground. And in fact, if you think about it, most things that man has built that does fly and float at some stage has to sit on the ground. So essentially everything in the built environment. So we better know what the ground does and how it reacts to being sat on. Um, of course, we also build with the earth. Um, for example, road embankments, dams, and we construct in the earth, so tunnels, deep excavations, that kind of thing. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, uh, and as Claire's mentioned, uh, soil mechanics is a, is a young science, geotechnical engineering. Um, I mean, obviously throughout history, uh, the behaviour of soil has been important to people because they've always built on the ground. But uh, up, up to the start of the 20th century, really, it was an art. I put that in specifically in inverted commas. Um, really based on, uh, on empirical knowledge, on precedent, and, and individual judgment, um, occasionally, as I say, with devastating consequences. Uh, this is a typical example, unfortunately. This is Dale Dyke Reservoir, which um, was built in 18... Well, just before that, 1862, I think. 1864, it failed catastrophically, and um, over 200, 244 people were drowned in Sheffield. Perhaps the most famous foundation failure of all time, the bell tower at Pisa, uh, built or started in 1173. It took them five years to realise they had dodgy ground conditions. Um, it then took them another 200 years to finish it with all sorts of aggro on the way. Um, and then a further 600 years before somebody really tackled stopping it falling down, uh, which was achieved. And of course, the last thing they wanted to do was put it straight again. Um, they just wanted to stop it leaning, which they did achieve. And in a peripheral way, we had a hand in that, and I'll cover that later. Um, so really, during the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution and what have you, huge expansion in construction works, railways, canals, docks, uh, etc much more ambitious structures than had ever been built before. Um, and so it became more and more necessary to have an intimate knowledge of how the ground, how soil behaves in those circumstances. Um, and although this sort of gave an impetus to the need to learn about soil mechanics, uh, there wasn't really a major step uh, breakthrough until, until the start of, of the 20th century, 1925. At this time, uh, Czech-born, but uh, actually re renowned Austrian civil engineer, Karl von Terzaghi, published his uh, magnum opus, which I won't attempt to pronounce. I don't know whether Julie wants to contribute at this stage, but <laughs> perhaps we'll just go past that. Essentially, what I've said underneath is what it was all about. Um, he described the physical properties of soil for the first time, really, to encapsulate this in written form um, describing how they behave under stress, uh, and he defined the fundamental principles of soil mechanics with which we all work with to this day. Uh, extremely uh, renowned and important man, as you can see, nine honorary doctorate degrees from around the world, um, and he was, in essence, the father of soil mechanics. He will come back to Carl Terzaghi in a minute. So, us, BRE, in at the beginning. 1925, that's the year that Karl Terzaghi published his, uh, his work. Um, the same year, the British Association for Advancement of Science uh, appointed a committee to investigate earth pressures, one of the subjects he'd looked at. Um, following year, Professor Jenkin uh, commenced work on that subject at uh, University of Oxford. He completed that work in, in a three-year period and was then, in 1929, uh, invited to join BRS, as it was then, to continue this work, which he did. 
Um, so as you can see, the origins of soil mechanics and BRE's involvement with it are very, very closely linked in time and indeed in, in, in personnel. Um, in 1933, that was the real start of, formally the start of uh, soil physics, as it was called then, section at BRS. Um, and that was uh, formed under Dr. Leonard Cooling. Um, and as I say, has continued to work in this field ever since. And indeed, anybody with a quick mind for uh, mental arithmetic will see that, in fact, it's this September is the 80th birthday of uh, geotechnics at BRE. This is an early photo taken in the, um, in the mid-40s of the group as it was then. The only reason I've shown this one uh, is my, uh, I love Bill Ward, who you can see, it's always puzzled me why in the 1940s anybody would really want to look like Adolf Hitler. Um, <laughs> but anyway, you know, um, Bill was a, a character of his own and he did what he wanted to do. Um, I just, this is a similar photo from the same era. I've ringed that chap there. That is a young Alex Skempton. That name will come up again, uh, so bear that in mind. He is one of the, uh, one of our greatest alumni and um, a very important man in soil mechanics. Started his career here and was a ranking lecturer. I'll come back to that later on various occasions. So bear that name in mind, ranking lecture. A little later photo uh, from the early 50s. I've circled Bill Ward again, Leonard Cooling, and also, also Arthur Penman, three more ranking lecturers. Keep that in mind. This is a picture from around 1970 of the group. It's grown considerably, as you can see. Three more ranking lecturers have been circled. And this picture was from uh, 1978. Um, this is at Bill Ward's retirement. I mean, just, where are we? Just look at that ridiculous tank top. <laughs> oh, oh, that's me, sorry. Uh, we'll, we'll move on, we'll move on rapidly. Okay, um, disasters and failures. Um, to a more serious note. Um, I mean, it's inevitable, as we all know, in modern times, when there's a disaster, a major failure with either loss of life or economic consequences, um, there's an investigation. It, that's inevitable. Um, and where these have occurred in geotechnical issues, very often it's been BRE or BRE in conjunction with other bodies who've investigated those disasters. I started talking about dams. Um, this is just the, uh, a, a brief overview of a, of a very checkered history, to say the least, uh, with dams in this country. Um, obviously, most of those failures were in the years I've already mentioned, uh, Dale Dyke, but uh, there's been quite a few with a lot of loss of life. The trouble is with dams, they're not particularly big, some of them some of the Victorian ones, but of course they do hold back a whole lot of water. And it's water that kills people. Water is a continuing theme through all of geotechnics, and it'll come up time and time again as the cause of problems. Um, the two failures in 1925 finally prompted the government to act on this kind of thing, in literal terms. And, and by 1930, the first Reservoir Safeties Act was in place. That was updated in 75, and it's quite likely to be updated again uh, very soon. It's interesting, since that act came into force in 1930, there's been no loss of life in dam incidents <coughs> since, throughout the 20th and into the 21st century. However, there have been a lot of incidents. That was the, uh, the la one of the last failures that prompted the, the act the, at Dalgorod. Uh, you can see the bank's been washed away. These are just incidents, believe it or not. Uh, Warm Withens in 70, much more recent. Carsington was a major modern dam. Fortunately, when it did fail, it failed before it was filled. BRE were heavily involved in the investigation there. And even as uh, recent as 2007, some of you may remember this in the papers, 
uh, Ollie Dam near uh, Rotherham had severe problems. It didn't fail, but it was a serious incident. Uh, and this, this is a continuing problem with, uh, essentially, uh, we have a lot of dams in this country. Most people won't realise that. Uh, and the vast majority of them, numerically, were built by the Victorians or earlier in the 20th century, uh, long before soil mechanics was a subject at all. So we come back to how it was built before, whether it stood up before, well, that'll do, we'll carry on the same way. <coughs> but it's an ageing population of dams, well over 2,000 in this country, um, and they need looking after. Just to show, and a slight aside, how things can go really drastically wrong, not here, unfortunately. Fortunate, this is the Teton Dam failure in Idaho, June 1976, um, caused by piping of the water through the embankment, back to this subject of water. Um, it resulted in, miraculously, and unbelievably, only 11 deaths, but 13,000 head of cattle. Um, two towns were wiped out, and it cost $100 million to build, and it cost $2 billion in compensation. A vast area was flooded and that dam was never rebuilt, but as time goes on, a timely warning. Moving on to other problems that we've had over the years uh, with flood defences. In 1953, storm surge in the North Sea um, overcame the flood defences in Canvey Island on the Thames estuary and uh, 58 people were drowned. Um, mainly because it was at night, people were in their bungalows and the water rose to ceiling level very fast. A real tragedy and BRE has played a huge role after that, as I'll come on to in a minute, in uh, investigating the issues of flood defences. That's one of the banks afterwards. You can see how it's all been scoured out and washed away. Other problems with slope stability, uh, obviously, well, not loss of life, but severe. This, if you were a commuter that day, you wouldn't be very pleased. Um, not an uncommon problem with slope stability of clay embankments. Landslides in general, another major problem. This is obviously an aerial photo of a major slide. Not in this country, but nevertheless, that's, that's irrelevant in, in many respects. Um, of course, a disaster that most of us will have heard of, will have been around at the time, was Aberfan. A landslide of sorts, uh, a, a waste tip liqui liquefied with spring water, it roared down the mountainside and engulfed the village. 144 people killed. Uh, Dr. Arthur Penman looked into this. Uh, he was one of our members of staff then. And he went down there straight away with several other people. And his report on that failure helped uh, to modify the approach to uh, the storage of mine waste from then onwards. There's a couple of other photos just showing you the incredible scale of the thing. The bottom picture on the right is the, is the school that was engulfed. Coastal erosion, uh, a problem that you'll have heard of almost, well, weekly on the news at the moment, but there's nothing new about this at all. That's an aerial photograph of major coastal uh, erosion. Uh, typical examples from years gone by on a huge scale in places. Uh, retaining structures, always been a problem. We talked at the beginning about earth pressures, and this is what it's all about, where Structures like this um, fail because of, 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 of problems with earth pressure. I don't know whether anybody can see the dates at the bottom there, but that's 1944, so that was during the war and when we could well afford to lose docking facilities. Another major issue over the decades, uh, not gone away, still a major problem is subsidence. Um, generally associated with the type of clay we have here in the southeast. Uh, changes in ground moisture cause these clays to swell or shrink and uh, that causes major problems 
for uh, shallow founded structures, houses in the main, and it's by far the most common type of foundation movement in, in the UK. Um, not a new subject by any means, Digest 3 was published in 1949 and we've published an awful lot of information on this subject since. Typical example of what can go wrong, that's an old photograph from that era, 1949, but this was taken only a couple of years ago, something we investigated. It had got so bad on this block of flats that in fact that had to be supported because it was structurally unsafe. And that sort of typical uh, internal damage, that's fairly modest damage compared to some I've seen. So, why field research? Well, Turt's argue was always one for a succinct and pithy saying. He, he, he said early on that, well, as soon as we pass from steel and concrete to earth, the omnipotence of theory ceases to exist. Basically, put simply, the ground is unpredictable. Uh, it's not like steel and concrete. Um, so one of the ways that we learn about how it behaves, learn why it behaved in certain ways we didn't want it to behave, is by monitoring ground behaviour. Uh, you know, as I said, it can inform us uh, how it reacts to external influences. Um, we can confirm design assumptions, so we get the feedback loop into design. And of course, uh, it can inform us as whether structures remain safe, and, and I use dams as an obvious example of that. So what is it we monitor? Well, first and foremost, obviously, ground properties its strength, its uh, bearing capacity, moisture conditions, etc. But second and probably uh, of, of equal importance is, is ground movement because virtually everything that happens with the ground, particularly if it's unpredicted, will involve movement. So we need to know what's moving, why it's moving, what further movement will occur. And why, do, why does movement occur? Well, generally it's because of changes in pressure in the soil, and, as I said, the theme running through all of this is, is water, the, the moisture condition of the soil. Um, Carl Tertzaghi also said, in a world without water, there would be no need for geotechnical engineers. Well, there would be no need for us either, but I mean, the point, I think, is, is clear. Water is, is, is the all-important issue. So, moving on to a few case histories um, of things we've done over the, over the years. Uh, this is a fairly major one. Deep excavation, New Palace Yard in London, in the, in the, uh, in the confines of the Palace of Westminster. Uh, a new multi-storey underground car park was to be built and BRE advised uh, as a government department on uh, the methodology, uh, how it should be monitored um, and etc. In the end, uh, the construction process did result in minimum ground movement. Of course, what everybody's concerned was that Big Ben would fall over. <laughs> not, not an unnatural uh, assumption or, or worry. Um, this was carried out back in the early 70s, as I say. That's an aerial shot of the Palace of Westminster. Uh, I'm just going to overlay the actual car park. Uh, so we've got... Uh, oh, wrong one the car park there, but you can see there are major sewers, there is uh, underground tunnels, and of course, there's the river close by. So not, a, not an uncomplicated situation. That shows you the scale of things. Now, Big Ben is not founded deep, so you can see why people would be worried about it. Um, and that just shows you, to scale, how the car park would look. So a big hole in the ground right next to Big Ben. Monitored very, very carefully and we're able to show that in fact the ground movements were very small indeed. I won't burden you with the detail, but we're, we're talking of the odd tens, 10 millimetres, that, that sort of 10, 20 millimetres. Um, and the data from that sort of investigation shows you the sort of zone of influence. We're, we're going out about 60 metres. Uh, those are the sort of movements you're getting by the time you've got out to, down to the bottom of the map. You've got no movement. Um, and that shows this sort of radial effect. So it goes out quite a long way from that hole in the ground. That's a typical example. Another one 
e earlier, that's the Shell building uh, in London, and uh, somebody's conveniently shown two little tunnels there. This was the, the nub of the problem. This was to be built on top, right on top, of two Bakerloo line tunnels. And the excavation for this building was to go within a metre of the crown of the tunnel. So clearly some concerns. This shows some of the monitoring that went on um, before, during and after the, uh, the excavations. Um, you can see my colleague Don Burford clearly very confident that the live rail's been switched off. The, uh, the construction once it was underway and what we actually were able to show was that's how much the tunnels heaved. They moved upwards because we'd relieved, relieved the earth pressure above them. That continued to be monitored to current days and that's continued to heave over all that period of time. Not, not huge amounts but nevertheless. Um, of course building on top of a tunnel can cause problems to the tunnel. Building a tunnel can cause problems to other infrastructure. And uh, this is another big part of our work. That's just really just to probably state the obvious. If you dig a hole in the ground, there's stress relief. And the ground wants to react to that. And it tends to want to move toward uh, the hole, the void. The problem with that is if you've got a building that's sitting right over it, it wants to sag and break distort. If you've got little buildings, they'll want to try and... I mean, this is exaggerated, of course, but you get the point. Um, so, typical tunnelling works in a city environment, huge structures, and one of the major... another major thing that we did, a case study, was to look at the effect of uh, tunnelling close to the mansion house. Um, and basically, the mansion house, that's how it sat, in relation to some new tunnels that were being dug. And essentially it was instrumented to death. Uh, I won't go into the detail, that would be the rest of the afternoon on its own. Um, but what we eventually was showing typical sort of data, how the building did move a little and it moved towards that excavation. So it's just like I showed in the previous sort of slide, that's the kind of effect. But that's the sort of thing, uh, again, we've been involved with. Now this is an interesting one. I come back to dams again, and we're going right back in time to 1937. Um, and this is really, essentially, what put us on the map. This is four years after we were formed, by, if you bear that in mind. So, Nolans were building a dam at Chingford in Essex. Um, it's now, it was then called Chingford Number 2, it's now William Girling. Um, before they got it finished, a major slip occurred. So part of the, well, a large part of the bank actually slipped. Not unnaturally a major concern, the question was why. Um, whilst that was de being debated um, by various people, um, they called in us to have a look at it. And essentially they called in Alex Skempton, who remembered that name. Um, he investigated and he came to the conclusion that actually it couldn't be built to the design as it stood. Now, nobody believed him. Metropolitan Water Board didn't, their, their consultants didn't, um, but some months later a second slip took place on the upstream side this time. Now by now Molums were tearing the hair out. They had been told, this is a public uh, construction project, you either build it or go broke. That's your choice. So in desperation, they called in Carl Terzaghi. They thought he might be interested enough to come across. And he did. And to cut a long story short, he, he recommended a re and did and carried out a redesign of the dam. Now that essentially um, corroborated the BRE view that it couldn't be built to the previous design. Um, there was uh, another uh, few years later, there was more problems with other dams, Muirhead Dam, very similar uh, uh, occurrence. Um, and it was put down to the fact that in the past, the dams had been built relatively slowly because it was 
generally built by hand. Mid 20th century, big earth moving machinery came in so they could build them much faster, which is great. Except they hadn't taken into account that that caused build ups of poor water pressure in the ground. Back to water again, and that caused the failures. Reduced the strength of the soil, the bank slipped. Um, essentially, that, those reports on those failures made both Carl Tertzaghi's name in Great Britain and certainly in our name. Uh, this is some of the first measurements of poor water pressure uh, carried out by us, 1951 by Arthur Penman, uh, at one of the, a couple of the dams. Um, between the 60s and the 80s, we started looking um, at modern dams. So in other words, dams that were being built at the time. Not have, there have not been many in this country over the decades, but some. Uh, and we've carried out a lot of field instrumentation, developed a lot of instrumentation, uh, accompanied by large-scale testing facilities here. And this is just a few of the dams. This is a Scamondon Dam. It's the only dam in this country, and to my knowledge, the only dam in the world that actually has a motorway running over it. Anybody's driven along the M62, you may have realised you were driving over a dam. Uh, that was how it was built. This is Windscar, similar, not close by in the, uh, in the Pennines. First dam in this country built with an asphaltic uh, membrane as the watertight element, which we looked at. Uh, this dam is in Scotland, Megat. It's the first dam in this country built with a central asphaltic core. So a couple of kilometres of reservoir are being held back by two foot of tarmac. And this is uh, Libriani Dam in central Wales. Uh, it's Britain's highest dam, which is why we looked at it and continue to monitor it to this day, in fact. Um, interesting ways of monitoring, uh, surveying. Sometimes, I don't know whether you can see that, but there's some fairly precarious... I should point out, by the way, a lot of the photos I'm going to show you, if anybody's got particularly queasy about health and safety, you really should avert your eyes because... Um, <laughs> You know, uh, and we've got built inside the dam, you've seen that slide before, to monitor how it behaves. And why do we do it? Well, we want to measure what happens when it's first filled, particularly, that's very important. And when, it, you know, when it's first filled with water, and essentially it's, it's the feedback loop I talked about. Does it behave as it was anticipated? This is the last major dam to be built in Britain, which we also had to play with. Uh, Roadford Dam in Devon, and uh, we were looking at various aspects of how it would behave. Again, feeding back into the feedback loop, as it were. Since the early 80s, we've had a major programme of looking at the old dams in Britain. As I said, there's a lot of them, well over 2,000, mostly built by the Victorians. Um, now, it's all very pretty, but what I draw your attention to is that curved water line. It should be straight. If you think about the geometry, uh, it means the, the bank has, has sagged. That's why you've got a curved water line, and that is a major problem. Uh, one of the ways we investigate it, we can stick earth pressure cells into the dams, into the central core, to see how that core is behaving. That's the, the central core is what holds the water back, uh, stops it leaking as it were, um, and we attach that to rods and we drill boreholes in the dam, we lower it down into the dam, push it into the core, like so, and we measure what goes on. Now, that's just a little thing of a dam. Um, so we're pushing things down into the core, but of course, if you push something down that way, you can only measure stress that way. So how do we measure stress that way? we come back to the miniature earth pressure cell. Um, and in my spare time, I dreamt up this crazy idea. There's what we want to measure, and that's how, in theory, we can. We certainly can't push it in from the side of the dam. Uh, and so we come up with a toy like this, little miniature earth pressure cells installed in a machine, lowered down a borehole, pushed out into the ground, and then we can measure what happens in the soil while the dam is living its life. Again, they're very pretty dams. Uh, 
nice at least when the sun's shining. Um, but what do you do, just going back one, what do you do, it's okay on the crest, but what do you do if you want to drill a borehole halfway down the bank? Well, you get BRE's scaffolders in, you find somewhere to attach safely to, you link it to something that hopefully won't move, you then lower the drilling rig down the thing. I told you, don't look if you're squeamish about health and safety. Uh, and you set up on the bank. And simple when you say it quickly. Um, OK, moving on. Deep on compacted fills. Claire very kindly mentioned, talk about building on fill. It's a major subject. Interestingly, just recently, I picked up a statistic that from ground improvement contractors like Kellers and Balfour Beatty. 90% of the work they do now is on filled ground. The government won't let us build on Greenbelt. There's a debate about that, but anyway, take my word for it. Um, and so what's left is the rubbish, quite literally. Now, that is a big hole in the ground. It's not a South African diamond mine. It's not a Brazilian copper mine. That is a Sheffield coal mine. Um, big hole in the ground, what do you do with it afterwards? Well, that's what you do with it if you do it right. Uh, ready for development uh, and tidied up the landscape to boot. That's what we want to avoid. Um, I can tell you that house hadn't even been occupied when that happened. It was, it was brand new but a major problem which technical details we haven't got time for. That's what we want to achieve on the right hand side and hopefully we've done enough work with Claire's, you know, she showed you the publication to inform industry how to do it right, we hope. That is a typical hole in the ground that we worked on. This is an open cast mine in Scotland. Uh, this is the sort of thing we do, drilling big holes in the ground, installing instruments that we develop here. That's called a spider magnet. When you're doing this kind of work, um, it, two things count. One is you get on with your fellow workers, and the other is that you wear decent deodorant. <laughs> um, it gets a bit cosy when you're trying to do this sort of thing. Um, we also have to live with the problems always in field monitoring of vandalism. And this is just a little example, one of many, many, where foundry sand having put the gauge in the ground, foundry sand had been kindly poured down the central hole by some dear little children um, and they filled it to the surface. And we got round the problem by blasting the sand out with compressed nitrogen. Save drilling another one anyway and putting it in the ground. But that's the sort of thing you're up against. Now, I put this slide up not to blind you with science or anything, but just to illustrate, one of the great things that we were able to do here at BRE is have continuity of study over long periods of time. Uh, almost unique within the engineering uh, community, as it were. Other things that we've looked at over the years, ground improvement techniques, um, varying sorts, thumping the ground with large weights, not sophisticated but effective. Um, installing things we call stone columns. We've done an awful lot of work on this kind of stuff. Um, always usually involving uh, field trials of one sort or another. Um, loading the ground and what have you. Um, so this is, this is what we call surcharge preloading. Uh, again, can't go into the detail, but basically it's just putting a big load on the ground before you build so that the building you're going to put on there doesn't notice it's been loaded. It's already been loaded to more than the building, in a nutshell. Various things we can do out on site, put instruments in the ground, raise them up through the bank. Doesn't always work out, of course. You've got bulldozers that tend to get in the way sometimes. Uh, bottom right, sometimes you can't even see what you're doing, but there we are, that's, that's field research. Um, but out of it all comes very valuable information, just exactly how much the ground has deformed under a bank and we can see how far down in the ground it's deformed. Rubbish, we're good at rubbish. Um, done a lot of work on refuse landfill over the years, um, how it behaves when it's been dumped in a hole in the ground. 
Um, the problem with, that's how it used to be done. Uh, it's done a little more scientifically now. Uh, lots of monitoring and lots of data that can come out of that that's sort of extremely, uh, extreme use to the industry. Um, for example, if you load up some landfill, uh, the leachate within the landfill rises each time, which is not good, uh, but at least you know it's happening. Um, that's how modern landfills built, well engineered. Um, we've devised some instrumentation to install. Uh, one of the problems with landfill instrumenta in inst in instrumentation in landfill is that basically that leachate eats the instrumentation. Um, it's highly acidic. PVC, brass, you name it, it just evaporates after a year or two, which is no good for what we want. So huge amount of trouble and effort went into this particular job to isolate all the instruments from the landfill. Uh, so it was all encapsulated in uh, plastic that won't get eaten by the acid. Um, the other problem with landfill, landfill uh, research is you've got to get up close and personal to people's rubbish. You know, the main thing to avoid is the yellow bin liners because that's hospital waste. We also have problems here with vandalism. This literally is virtually a bomb-proof uh, readout thing. I mean, you've got really professional vandals on these sites. These are guys who come with angle grinders in their back pockets. <laughs> I kid you not. Um, you know, so they, they're, they're equipped for all eventualities. And this is us just putting instruments into a landfill as it's been built, encapsulating them all in HDP plastic. And they get buried and we read what goes on. Moving on to some other things, I'll rattle along here. Um, some of the other subjects we've looked at, uh, coastal stability, again, as I mentioned earlier on, a subject that's it's now, it's then, it's, it's always been going on. Uh, did a lot of work. And this shows uh, just a, a very brief idea of drilling holes into the side of cliffs to measure how they're moving, why they're moving. Um, we've looked at barriers for contaminated ground. Uh, this is to contain contaminants on sites like former gas works, etc. Um, and a lot of that work fed into an ICE specification for trench and slurry walls. Uh, tunnelling, I mentioned, we've done a lot of work on tunnelling. Um, this is some of the early work where we're strain gauging tunnel linings, um, which were at the time 50 years old. But what we were able to do, of course, was when they were removed, we could measure their de-stressing, which by back calculation tells you how much load was on them in the first place, which was an unknown at the time. Uh, and you can see... Uh, on the right hand side there, some tunnel linings being tested under uh, control conditions here at BRE in building 12. Um, so tunnelling, um, we've been involved in uh, a lot of research over the years, segmental linings, um, as I said about the stresses, uh, we've participated in all sorts of investigations to essentially push forward the knowledge uh, about uh, tunnelling, particularly in, in the sort of London area, but not, not exclusively. Um, so basically, uh, yes, in also tunnelling, sorry. Uh, we also were involved in a major uh, field trial where a, a, a trial tunnel was actually dug uh, in the northeast of England alongside uh, the, the route for a reel water transfer tunnel and we carried out a lot of research into that so we're miners as well as uh, as well as geotechnical engineers. Um, deep foundations are ma another major area of study. Uh, piles essentially what I mean by deep foundations. Um, particularly in the London area in London clay where very deep foundations have traditionally been required for high-rise buildings etc. Um, and this work, in essence, led to a lot of new knowledge about how piles work, um, and that in turn is fed back into the design process. 
Um, just one example, Hiscock House in uh, North London. A, it was a 16-storey block of flats. We instrumented it when it was built, and back to continuity again, we were able to carry on monitoring it when it was demolished. So very valuable information came out of that, all about uh, as to how piles behave and how they behave in the long term. That's his cock house, uh, and as I say, we're monitoring it during demolition. That's just a picture of uh, building some very special load cells to monitor pile behaviour down at the bottom of a pile shaft. Again, look away if you don't feel squeamish about health and safety. Um, Large-scale testing, another very important area that we've looked at. Um, John in the audience here has done a huge amount of work over many decades, you won't mind me saying, on this problem. Um, understanding how the ground behaves at large scale, for real, rather than just as little samples in the laboratory. Um, we had our own huge, still have our own huge loading frame. Um, you can tell by the scale of that, it's... Uh, delivers up to 1,000 tonnes? 500 tonnes. The idea is you can do what we call a plate loading test to test the behaviour of the ground either at the surface or right down a shaft, which is sort of illustrated there. Major step forward in understanding the ground, and that's a slightly smaller scale one. Uh, i just thrown this one in. This is a, a large-scale field trial at Munford in Norfolk, uh, carried out in the early 60s, um, that tank is, uh, was part of the trial. That was a loading test. That's 18 metres diameter and 18 metres high, filled with water uh, to test the ground, to feed back real information about the ground. I'm skimming the subject horrendously, but anyway. Uh, a lot of offshore work we've done um, in the 1970s, uh, looking at sampling, this is all of course to do with the oil industry, offshore industry, sampling and understanding sample behaviour as it comes out the ground, or in this case the seabed. So we've got mobile laboratories designed, built out on the rigs. Test the samples the minute they come out the ground. Um, this was an interesting one. Uh, we were looking, or asked to look at one of the possibilities of getting rid of rad waste. And at the time, may seem laughable now, but at the time, one of the ideas was to bury it in the deep seabed sediment. And uh, part of that investigation was to build these three-ton torpedoes to drop them into uh, over five kilometres of water and to measure exactly what they did when they hit the seabed. Now, thinking about the technology for doing that, that is not a mean feat. Um, but what we discovered was that, for example, its terminal velocity when it hit the seabed was 68 metres a second, and it buried itself by up to 60 metres. We had a load of these lying around the site at one time just strewn along the roadsides. Now, of course, in this day and age, satellite technology would have spotted them and we'd have probably been obliterated by a drone strike. But anyway, uh, you know, it was a different era then. Uh, offshore work, uh, lots of offshore work. We looked at, uh, uh, this was a, a thing called OSFLAG, um, essentially a scale model of the foot of, a, of an oil rig. And uh, you can see the sort of scale of it. Uh, this was deployed out in uh, Christchurch Bay uh, near the Isle of Wight. And we got involved on board there. And if you look very carefully, you can just see my starting to bald head in there. <laughs> Overseas, uh, we haven't been confined to the uh, UK. Uh, We've carried out work in Jordan. I may have missed some of these off the list uh, to look at uh, problems with housing out there on clay soils um, in Iraq. Now, this was at the time of the Iraq-Iran war. The blue arrow represents what the Iranians might have done. The red arrows represent what our guys intended to do. 
And I, I joke not, they had four-wheel drive vehicles ready to head west across the desert. Uh, that's one of my little sojourns to the Middle East, uh, devised a, an instrumentation system to go under those tanks to measure what was happening when they were loaded. Me again, unfortunately, out in Kazakhstan, uh, looking at the uh, use of a, a particular type of ground improvement technique. Me again in Italy, uh, not actually there, it was uh, an oil refinery, but I thought that picture looked a bit nicer. Um, <laughs> We've done work on ground, uh, ground properties, uh, not only here, of course, but in France. Uh, you know, you go where the geology takes you. Um, a lot of work, as I've explained, in the North Sea, uh, the, uh, the oil fields and gas fields. Uh, again, work in Norway and Denmark on ground properties. Uh, uh, in Germany, that was the uh, uh, use of a new type of instrument to measure ground properties and pile capacity. Um, what did I miss there? Oh yes, and as I was saying, the, the, the offshore stuff out in, in the Atlantic. So, I mentioned early on about the ranking lecture. I finally got back round to it. Um, in 1974, uh, Professor Nash commented that the lecturer, uh, then Professor Gibson, who had started all his work at BRS, uh, he described the propagating house where Leonard Cooling created the right atmosphere for so many talented people. Uh, I unashamedly put that up, really, because it does follow through. Just a little run-through of achievements. The numbers here are probably, if anything, an underestimate. I've scoured the archives, but I may have missed a few. 1,050 learned journals conference papers, digests, etc. since 1933, endless BSI and Eurocode committees, 19 PhDs registered based on work at BRE, six DSCs awarded on work at BRE, innumerable, I, cu I couldn't remember, you know, I couldn't start enumerating awards and medals, two fellows of the Royal Academy, uh, one fellow of the Royal Society, at least 11 former members of BRE have subsequently become university professors. We have a CBE in the alumni, we have a knighthood in the alumni, and 10 ranking lecturers. Now, I promised the ranking lecture. Um, means nothing to most people, but to us it's pretty much everything. Uh, it's an internationally renowned guest lecture. Uh, held at Imperial College each year. It's organised by the BGA, the British Geotechnical Association. And speakers are invited uh, on professional merit and are people from the very top of the profession. Uh, they're alternately chosen from abroad and, and here. And essentially, the being invited to present the ranking lecture is, is, the, is the, 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 the high point of anybody's career in this field. And... Professor John Burland, who uh, kindly gave the vote of thanks to uh, the last of our ranking lecturers, uh, Andrew Charles, in 2008, uh, in the beginning of his vote of thanks, which I'm just going to play for you now because I think it, it really sums up uh, pretty much everything I've been talking about. Gentlemen, a Dr. Andrew Charles is the fourth ranking lecturer from the Building Research Establishment. Now, if one looks a little more closely at the statistics, we find that no less than 10 ranking lecturers spent what I call their formative geotechnical years at BRE. Uh, I very deliberately kept the precise definition of the phrase formative geotechnical years rather vague. And I hope that my colleagues uh, in this place will forgive me if I say that according to my own interpretation of the meaning of that phrase, this score of 10 even beats Imperial College's contribution to the geotechnical formation of ranking lecturers. I expect the roof to collapse. Then. <laughs> That's you know, more succinct than I could say. So... Just starting to round up then, field monitoring and geotechnics, which is essentially what we've done. The 
uh, right, uh, the, sorry, the left-hand picture um, really sums up what is absolutely necessary. It is teamwork, but you've always got to have somebody who remains clean with the notebook. That's absolutely essential. Um, and you also have willing people to stand in trenches to do surveying. Now, that is not uh, an itinerant labourer. That is Professor Arthur Penman. And as you can see, on a dam site in the early 80s, the necessity for PPE, hard hats, and everything else was not necessarily required. So, just to summarise then, um, there are many, many times over the last 38 years when I've been on site and I've thought to myself, my goodness, they're paying me for this. <laughs> then I remember why they're paying me for this. <laughs> it rains a lot out there, uh, which is, you know, can be a little challenging at times. But then you get to play with big toys. And it's exciting at times. But it's also pretty dirty at times. <laughs> Fairly precarious at times. And there are occasions when you really need to go that extra mile <laughs> to get the data. Again, if Ray was here, yeah, look away now. Um, you have to improvise. This is in a, the Angel, down at the Angel and the um, uh, tube tunnel. That's really a drilling rig that's meant to work vertically, but our lads just sort of find a way of doing things. And occasionally you have other hazards. The animal kingdom out there it steps in, but we just keep calm and carry on. <laughs> Again, back to Carl Terzaghi, one last pithy saying, there is no glory in the foundations. However, uh, I would argue there's plenty of enjoyment and a lot of fun. Thank you very much.